Hello, and welcome back to History 101, World Civilization to 1100. This is Professor Judy Gahn at Colorado State University in Pueblo. We are in the middle of Unit 3, Government and the Articulation of Political Power. And today we're going to turn eastward to the Zhou and the Qin dynasties in China. Our primary sources for the in-class readings uh, will allow us to examine the political philosophies of these two dynasties. But today we want to consider a few other matters first before we go ahead and talk about those political philosophies. First of all, I want to point out that China was actually one of the Great River Valley civilizations, although it comes about a thousand years after the Great River Valley civilizations of uh, the Nile, Mesopotamia, and the Indus. If you do not immediately recognize these Great River Valley civilizations, you would like to pause right now, I believe, and uh, take a look and figure out which is which and what they are. Those should be immediately identifiable to you. There are two main geographical circumstances of China that I want to point out to you. First of all, the isolation from the West. Uh, we have here, between uh, Chinese territory and India, the Himalayas, right? The biggest mountain range in the world, uh, the tallest mountains in the world. And so the Chinese were isolated from the uh, India and the West uh, in a way that, for example, uh, Mesopotamia and the Indus River Valleys were not. Um, so uh, China develops in isolation from the West, although not in isolation from all peoples, of course. Uh, and as we can see in our textbook, although we're not reading all these sections, China interacts with uh, people in Japan, Korea, uh, Thailand, uh, and of course the people in the North in the Great Steppes. So um, isolation from the West it is not, does not equal isolation exactly. The other geographical circumstance I would like you to notice is that the rivers run from west to east. They do not run north-south. Since it was always cheaper and faster to travel by water than to travel by land, really all the way until the 19th century and the development of the steam engine and the modern locomotive, um, in other words, before trains, it was cheaper to travel by water and land. So communication was far easier uh, along the rivers than elsewhere in China. Those two geographical circumstances help show how China was shaped. China was uh, is organized uh, politically by dynasties. Usually when we use the word dynasties, what we're talking about is one particular family ruling uh, a, a country. When we talk about dynasties in China, what we're talking about is one particular um, uh, province, one particular region in China that has taken over other territories and is in command. Uh, today, we'll we want to pay attention to uh, the Shang Dynasty along the Yellow River primarily, the Zhou Dynasty, which is where we get the Mandate of Heaven, and the Qin Dynasty. There are a couple characteristics that we'll notice in the in the development of dynasties in China. Two in particular, I want you to pay attention to. One is that, generally speaking. This is not true all the time, but for much of the development of dynasties, what we see is an ever-increasing size, ever-increasing control of territory. Uh, so the Shang Dynasty uh, increases in size when the Zhou takes over, and then uh, the Qin Dynasty will be larger again than the Zhou Dynasty. So we'll see these. Uh, this is one of the characteristics of dynasties in China. And you can link to this uh, website from this video. Another characteristic of dynasties in China is that they grow increasingly centralized. Uh, each time we move into a new dynasty, there will be an increase in centralization. As I say, this is not entirely smooth, but uh, generally speaking, this is a pattern we will see throughout Imperial Chinese history. 
So let's turn to the early dynasty of China, the Shang Dynasty, which lasts from about 1500 to about 1045. Um, and as I said, it's mostly along the Yellow River, although it does come down to the North Fork of the Yangtze. I'm not going to say a whole lot about uh, the Shang Dynasty, except that it's the first dynasty for which we have archaeological evidence. So we're certain it exists. According to our early Chinese historians, there's one dynasty that precedes it, the Xia Dynasty, which um, we don't yet have archaeological evidence for. So people are suspicious about whether it exists or not. Although, I have to say, that used to be the case for the Shang Dynasty, and it wasn't until the 20th century that we discovered archaeological evidence that supported the historical, uh, the literary evidence about uh, the Shang Dynasty. So there may be a dynasty that precedes it, but we don't know enough about it to really talk about it. The Shang, I want to talk about um, primarily because one of the characteristics of China, much like we said about Egypt and to some degree Rome, is that it's quite conservative. So there are many things that develop in the Shang Dynasty that remain important for the rest of Chinese history. So uh, first of all, we see kingship in the Shang Dynasty and sanctioned to some degree by the gods. That is, the king can uh, communicate with the gods, as can a few other people. The other thing we see in the Shang Dynasty is uh, ancestor worship. And this is characteristic of the rest of Imperial China as well, the worship of one's ancestors. Divination means reading the signs of the gods, you know, consulting the gods and getting information back from the gods. And that is a practice that we see in uh, the Shang Dynasty and that continues for a while in Chinese history. The image that you see here is actually what we call an oracle bone. So on the bones of animals, long dead animals of course, um, questions for the gods are carved and then the answer is carved and then the outcome is carved. What actually happened is carved into the bones, which also shows to us that we have writing, the introduction of writing. Now, um, writing in China, in uh, original, the original writing in China, bears a closer similarity to modern Chinese writing than in any other writing system. Uh, so again, that conservative nature um, of uh, Chinese history um, means that the language is written the, s the same way as it has been uh, since the beginning. Not that all of these are easily identifiable signs, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the similarities are a lot closer than cuneiform is, for example, uh, to modern texts in Iraq. I also wanted to point to the Shang because it's not very often in world history that we see women with substantial political and military power. And so I wanted to point out just this one woman. You can investigate more on your own on the internet if you're interested. Uh, but her name is Fu Hao, and she was a wife of the 21st king of the Shang dynasty, Wu Ding. And um, we discovered her tomb um, about half a century ago, I think and uh, all these cool jades and all this wealth and everything in it. And we learned, in fact, that Fu Hao controlled her own town and, in fact, also led armies in battle, uh, many, many troops in battle. So uh, we see that uh, women in the Shang Dynasty, at least elite women, a limited number of them, could potentially have access to a uh, political and military power. And that's uh, unusual enough in world history to be commented upon. It's also unusual in Chinese history. But let's turn now from to the end of the Shang Dynasty, the collapse. Apparently, according to the story, the Shang Dynasty collapses because the last ruler of the Shang Dynasty was a despot, was a bad ruler. Uh, and so the new good ruler of the Zhou dynasty took over uh, and created the new dynasty. We'll talk more about this ideology uh, when you read the Mandate of Heaven. And we'll talk about this in class. So 
the political structure of the Zhou is sometimes re referred to as proto-feudal. Now we saw the feudal political structure in me medieval Europe where um, the relationships depended on these fealty oaths like the one we read for last time and the and sort of this contract right between the lord and the vassal in the Zhou dynasty if it is proto-feudal it's based on family and kinship uh, more than on these contractual obligations that we get in the middle ages what we basically mean is although the Zhou had uh, a ruler a single ruler he did not have a lot of direct political power. Most of the political power belonged in the hands of local aristocracy throughout the Zhou, the Zhou dynasty, the Zhou territory. Okay, the Zhou seems to last a very long time, uh, from 1045 until 256, we date the Zhou dynasty, but don't get to thinking there is all nice stability and order throughout all that period. Um, the Western Zhou collapses in 771 uh, with uh, external troubles from nomads to the north and internal disputes. And uh, in 771, the capital is moved to the eastern part of the Zhou. Uh, and we get what we call the spring and autumn period. During the spring and autumn period is when Kung Fu Tzu, or as his Latinized name, Confucius, uh, lived. And it's Confucian philosophy that generates the notions that you see in the Mandate of Heaven. So we'll talk more about that next time. Also, the after the so-called Spring and Autumn period, which is itself chaotic enough, we have the Warring States period, where all the different provinces are fighting for control of territory. So there's a lot of political chaos uh, in the uh, in the late Zhou period and the warring states while we, while we still count it under the Zhou dynasty the Zhou actually control very little of that and ultimately the state or the province that's going to take over is going to be the Qin dynasty the Qin Dynasty is remarkably short-lived from 221 to 207 BCE. This is important for you to know. Uh, we talk about the Qin Dynasty because although it is remarkably short-lived, it's basically the, the rule of one person and when he dies it does not remain intact after that. But what he does is he unifies China. We call him Xi Huangdi, the first emperor of China, because he made it really an empire. And so we'll look at his political philosophy, uh, legalism, for next time. should say also, under Xi Huangdi, we have the beginnings of the construction of the Great Wall that you can see here on the slide. So, these are the topics for conversation. Go ahead and pause the video so you can write these down. And we'll try to compare the philosophy of the Zhou dynasty with the philosophy of the Qin dynasty when we're in class, and then see how both of them compare with other political philosophies that have been illustrated in our primary sources. I look forward to talking with you in class. Bye.